Hello Calc Kids, this is Mr. Bean. Today we're going to do the properties of definite integrals. Uh, I think you're going to like this because it's not too bad. There's a lot of things you've already learned by intuition as we've been playing around with integrals and the area under the curve. So I've set up here on this first problem, I've already written down a little bit of the area, what this area represents to help us get started. And let's do something we've already been doing, this, this definite integral from 0 to 12. So I want the area under the curve from x0 and then the upper limit of 12. So I've written all these things down and that gives us 2 pi plus, and then I add these up, 2 plus 2 plus 1, that's 5, so I have a 5, but then I subtract when something is under the x-axis, so I would subtract the 4, so that gives us an answer of 2 pi plus 1. Okay, so that is something we've already been doing. Now to something that's different, and that is, what if we start at 12 and work our way back to 0? So we're going to start here and then go this direction. What happens then? Well, what happens is the area under the curve takes the opposite sign. So if this was a negative 4 underneath the x-axis, this 1 and 3 was 4. When we went with this first problem, that was a minus 4. But now it's going to be a positive 4. And then when we work this way, again, it's going to be negative on top. So that's a minus 5. And then we subtract the 2 pi because that's on top and we're going backwards. So when you're going backwards with these, these uh, limits, when you exchange the limits, you get the opposite sign. So then that would be a negative one minus two pi, which if you look at our first answer, it's our first answer times a negative one. So that now leads us to some properties. Here we have, this is the one we just did, this reversal of limits, right? So if it's b to a, it's the same thing as taking a to b, but negative. So that's the one we just did. Now what if we had an equivalent limit? So if the lower limit and the upper limit are exactly the same thing, that's just zero. You don't have anything. If your width of your area is nothing, then your area is also, I mean, it's zero, if your width is zero. Uh, this one, multiplying by a constant, if we have a function and you have this number that you're multiplying it by, if you could factor it out, what's nice about this is it just comes to the front. It's kind of like the constant rule with derivatives. It's just the number can just be brought to the front of it. And that's what happens here. The number can be brought to the front of the integral and it's the same thing. This is one that's fairly intuitive that would make sense to you. If you're going from A to C, and then you're going from C to B. I know those, those letters are not in order, but that's because normally we just go from A to B. So this is what you get. You get an integral from A to B. If you're going, if C is in between A and B, you're going from A to C and then C to B. Let me show you what I'm talking about with this. If I go back to this one, it's just as simple as saying the integral from zero to 12 of F of X, that's supposed to be 12, of F of X is equivalent to, uh, it's equivalent to saying like I could go from zero to four, so I could stop here of f and then add four to 12 of f of x. Okay, it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, yeah, duh. If you go from zero to four and add up the area and then do another area from four to 12, it's the same thing as just saying from zero to 12. But we wanna make sure we explicitly state that, that we have a little rule for that. That's one of the properties of integrals. Now addition, real simple, you can just take these two functions separately and take each of the integrals. So you just do a to b integral of f and then a to b integral of g, add them up together. So that's how you do these. Uh, and same thing with subtraction. Two integrals can be separated, or the two functions, I mean, can be separated and take the integral of each one and add up the area under the curve. Okay, so get these properties down and now let's get into some practice and use them. Uh, I've written down a couple areas here because that's what affects number three and four. And I should say this, I haven't really talked about this dx here. This dx means with respect to x. And when we say with respect to x, that's an important phrase because it means we're moving along the x-axis to the, take the area. We will later, don't stress about it yet, we'll eventually, we're gonna do the area with respect to y, which means we're gonna do it a up and down the y-axis and we're gonna go this way for taking the area like of a, of a curve like this. Okay, don't stress about that yet. I just wanted to explain that that's what the, the dx means. It's with respect to x and we're gonna move along the x-axis and go straight up and down for our area when we do this. All right, so seven to six. Uh, seven to six is starting at seven and going this way, right? So you're moving left, so it's the opposite sign. So this one's negative two. And then 12 to eight, but then, oh, look at that. There's a little three right there. I almost missed that. So that's the same thing as saying three integral. Oh, let's do this. Negative three integral. And then I'm gonna switch the signs, eight to 12 of f of x dx. So I can use properties to manipulate this around and change this up a little bit. So then this is going to be negative three times and then the area 
between eight and 12, I already figured out was negative four, right? So that's a negative four. So then I have a equals a positive 12. So using properties of integrals, there's a few different ways that you can manipulate these expressions to come up with your answer. Okay, using them some more. Now I have one, two, three different integrals. This one's f of x, this one's f of x, this one's g of x, so be careful there. And then you just have your negative two to one, your different boundaries on your lower and upper limit. So what we're doing for this first one is we're trying to figure out from five to one of f of x. Well, what we do know is right there, we know that from one to five, the integral of f of x is negative three. So if I'm just switching the upper and lower limit, that becomes the opposite and is positive three instead of negative three. Negative two to five. So of f, I don't have negative two to five, but I have negative two to one, and then I have one to five. So this is basically this here. It's these two integrals that are being added up. That's what this one is. So then I have to just figure out, okay, well, that's a four plus a negative three. So that equals one. And then this one here, I'm doing negative two to one of f of x. So this addition means I can separate them and take them individually. So the negative two to one of f of x, that's a four here. So I'm gonna say four plus, and now I'm gonna do two times. What is the integral of g of x from negative two to one? That's eight. So we just have four plus 16 gives us 20. Here's an interesting one, zero to one of f of x. Well, I have negative two to one, so zero to one is inside this integral somewhere. But I don't know exactly what's going on from zero to one. So this is one that you cannot figure it out. So I'm just gonna write down cannot be determined. And sometimes that will be one of the multiple choice answers that they'll give you on an AP exam that you can't figure it out based on the information that's given. You need more information to be able to do this one. All right, one to negative two, uh, that's flipping these again, right? And it's F, yes it is. So I'm gonna flip these back, pull the three out. This is similar to another one I've done. So pull the three out and make it negative and then go from negative two to one of F of X respect to x. So then this is negative three times four. All right, so that equals negative 12. And then this one, I have a functions, two functions being subtracted, but my lower limit and my upper limit are identical. So my width is zero. There's no area here. So we just have nothing for our area. And now some piecewise functions. Don't worry, this is not gonna be that, that difficult. Sometimes we get scared of piecewise functions, but it's really not bad. So we just need to, well, if you don't know how to draw piecewise functions, then yes, this is <laughs> challenging, sorry. But uh, let's do this line y equals three. Oh, that was so close to being straight. Oh, that was awful. <laughs> I cheated, I used a drawing tool. Okay, so there we have a line of y equals three when x is less than two. Let me put an open circle here. So open circle right there at two. And then four minus x. So that would be a line that would have a y-intercept of four. One, two, three, four. And a slope of negative one going down like this. And then it's a solid circle there. And then it's gonna keep going down that way. Okay, and then let me erase this part that I didn't need. All right, there's my piecewise function. So now I, I have this piecewise function. I'm doing the area under the curve from one to five. So I'll start here at one and I'm going up until I get to five. So the area under the curve, this is weird because you have this area here, but then it jumps. Well, it doesn't matter. We're still going to just have this area right there. And then even though it jumps, it just jumps down and stays between the function and the x-axis. And then again here, this is now negative area there. So what I do is I just take each of these pieces, even though they're weird shapes, it's still nice geometric shapes for us. So this rectangle here is a three, so I'm gonna say three, and then I add this triangle is going to be two, and then I subtract the area of this little piece here, which is just a half. So I have five minus a half, so that equals four and a half, or 4.5. So the big point of this is when you have piecewise functions, you still treat it just the same. If you can think of it geometrically, the shape of it, what it's doing is it's the function and then right underneath it to the x-axis. And then even if it has a jump, that's okay. You just don't include this piece here. You just jump to where the graph is and then to the x-axis. That's the area, it's the boundaries of the area. All right, here we have an absolute value. I wanna mention this one because, well, a couple things about absolute value, but these really are piecewise functions. What is a what is an absolute value graph look like? It creates a V shape. So you should have a graph like this. It's got the V right there at X equals two, shifted right two. And now we're going from zero to five. So I'm gonna take this area here 
and then this area here all the way up until I get to five. So that's the area. So the, this is what the, this integral represents. So when you can think of absolute value graphs, think of them as piecewise functions, and then it's a lot easier to figure out. So what is this here? This is the area of two, so I'm gonna say two, and then I add because this is all above the x-axis. That one is half of nine, right? Yes, nine, so 4.5, half of nine is 4.5, and that equals 6.5 for my area under the curve of this absolute value function. Okay, two more things to talk about. The difference between these two things, these absolute values, these are not identical. They have different answers. So let me show you, first of all, when you have the absolute value on the outside of the integral, all this means is you figure out what the integral is and then you take the absolute value of it. So I'm gonna have the absolute value of, so what is this? This is, this area is half a circle. So it's pi over two, the radius is just one. This one's pi over two, and this one is two for that area there. All right, so I'm going from negative two to four. This is negative area, so I'm gonna say negative pi over two. This is positive area, so I'm gonna add pi over two. And then the last area is also positive, so I will add two. And then that equals, is those cancel to zero, you get the absolute value of two, which is two. So there we go for that one. Now this one's very different we're taking the integral of the absolute value of the function. So when you have the absolute value of a function, that means no areas are negative. If there's anything that is underneath the x-axis down here, anything down here will go, will flip up here to the positive side. So this part of it would be, oh, that was so close to drawing that well. This would be a graph that looks like that and it's positive pi over two now, instead of negative, this part's gone and it just jumps up here. So now when we do this, this is going to say, we're gonna take the area of these pieces. So it's pi over two plus pi over two plus two. And so then that equals, this simplifies to just pi, two halves equal a whole plus two. So you can see very different answers. One is taking the absolute value after you're done. One is taking the absolute value first, which makes all of the area positive. And our last thing you need a calculator for. If you don't have a calculator, pause the video and go grab one because you need one and you gotta practice. It's amazing how many times kids can't do this when I see them come up for mastery checks because they actually didn't ever practice this with a calculator. Let's start off by sketching the graph of these things. So the graph of this one, x minus one, square root. So remember square root graph goes something like this. It's like, if you could have a parabola like that, it's the top half of the parabola. That's what this really is, square root graph. So we're gonna shift right one. And then we have a parabola that goes, let's see, if I go over one, up one, if I start from here and go over four, one, two, three, four, up two, because that's like a square root curve. Okay, mine looks almost like a straight line. Sorry, it's supposed to be curved right there. All right, so square root graph. And then I'm looking at the interval from two to three. So I'm gonna go from two to three. That's a really tiny area right here. That's it. This is the only part I'm looking at. So what is the area of that? Well, you haven't learned how to do this yet. We're going to learn, but this looks like it covers this one square and then a little bit more, maybe a quarter more, but we're not gonna guess. We're gonna let the calculator do this for us. So grab your calculator and here's how it works. So I'm going to type math option number nine. So I could just hit math nine or scroll down here. And this does a functions integral. So if you don't have a TI-84, if you have something else, you'll have to figure it out on yours. But so you just have to Google, how do you do an integral with a integral with a whatever Casio or HP calculator, whatever your model is. So in this case, I just do the lower boundary is two, upper boundary is three, and then I type in the square root stuff. So square root of X minus one. Uh, and then I come out here and I'm gonna do it with respect to X. Enter. Okay, yeah, oh, look, drag this over here. So that's really close to what I thought it might've been. I was guessing a little bit more than one, like one and a quarter or so. So this is one, I should say approximately, not equals, approximately 1.21. And then I could either go eight or I could round up to nine. I'm gonna write four decimals just so you can see it, but I could say either 1.219 or 1.218, either way works. So let's do that again for this one. In fact, let's have you pause and do it on your own. But let me just remind you, math number nine, that's how you get the integral to show up here. Okay, so go ahead and pause this and try that one on your own. And you should have come up with negative four on the money. 
So this is a little bit weird because it has these shapes that you'd think you could do geometrically, but they're pretty tricky because they do not end right on a nice perfect endpoint. See this here from negative two all the way up to one, two, three, four. So you have this negative area and then a little bit of a positive area. And so that does throw things off a little bit for, for calculating geometrically. And that's where it's nice. If you didn't know how to do it, but you're allowed to use a calculator, then just do math nine. So again, we'll, we'll learn in the next couple of lessons, we're gonna learn how to do this the long way by hand, but a calculator, if it's allowed on the problem, math nine, super fast and easy to calculate the area under the curve. Okay, we've covered everything for this lesson. Rock that mastery check, and I'll see you back in the next one.